I don't know where everybody else is, but I'm getting started. So good morning to everybody who's here. And if you see me later on YouTube, good day to you. And it's time for another exciting morning of chemistry with your host, me, Dr. White. Now, important announcements. One, tomorrow will be test number four. Again, tomorrow I'll be giving test number four, just like I've given the other test uh, by nine o'clock. Probably uh, I'll have the password sent out to you probably earlier. Uh, later today, I'll be uploading test number four to the assignment area, along with a uh, periodic table and the instructions how to do test number four, and you'll do it. And uh, also, I'll be uploading today the lab for tomorrow, our last lab. Oh, time flies when you're having fun with chemistry. Can you imagine this is only one more week after tomorrow and we're done? But anyways, time flies when you're having fun with chemistry. All right, today's day, yeah, hold on. Today's game plan. One, I'm gonna do the review for test number four. Then I'll go over pH problem set. Then I'll do chapter 17, radiation and nuclear energy. Everything you wanna know in about 10 minutes, which is just a quick, there's some, a couple important points. Now, tomorrow, I'm gonna to spend the whole, well, not the whole time. First, I'll go over the titration lab you'll be doing. And then I will spend the whole time doing some important problems for test four. Because I did have to rush on certain things and tomorrow will give me time to help you prepare for test four. So you'll be all ready. And one final thing, late last night, if you go to your grades in Blackboard, you'll see I uploaded the scores for labs 9, 10, and if you hand it in, also 11. And I'd highly recommend, and I'll be sending out an email to everybody, if you don't see a score for your lab, one, you never handed it in, two, I couldn't open it up in Blackboard, or three, I missed it. You should check that each lab you handed in, you get a score. Uh, by the way, uh, for the lab on the equilibrium, if you got the reactions, which side the heat goes wrong, gets put wrong, I took off one point. All right, let's get going, because the clock is ticking. All right, Blackboard, thumbs up. Do you see test number? Thank you. I love you, people. All right, when we talk about material on test number four, the first thing you should know is the collision theory. And important features you should know is, in order for a reaction to occur, molecules must collide. And when they collide, another feature is they must have a minimum amount of energy that's called the activation energy for chemical reaction to occur. Again, the activation energy is the minimal amount of energy molecules must have when they collide for a reaction to occur. Now, a third part of the collision theory you should be familiar with is when they do collide, they must have the proper orientation. Just like when you put a key into lock, it has to be the proper orientation to fit in and work, same thing with molecules colliding and reacting. Now, next I talked about reaction rate, and that's the rate at which products are made or reactions are consumed. Consumed is a fancy word for being used up or disappearing. Now, you should be familiar with what factors that influence the reaction rate. Well, first of all, the physical nature of the reactants, are they solid, liquid, or gas, will affect it. An important one is concentration of the reactants. The higher the concentration for most reactions, 
the faster it will go. Now, if you notice, I've gotten big, bold, important, important, and that's the reaction temperature. And you should know the rule of thumb. Rule of thumb means it's true about 95 or more percent, but not 100%, because for 100% it would be a law, but it's not, that the chemical rate of chemical reaction, the reaction rate doubles for every 10 degrees C increase in the reaction temperature. Again, what makes a reaction go faster? In this case, you should know that the rate of a chemical reaction doubles for every 10 degrees C increase in the reaction temperature. Now, another factor that you can use or a way to influence to make a reaction rate go faster, use a catalyst. And how does a catalyst work? By lowering the activation energy. How does a catalyst work? By lowering the activation energy. Now, I won't draw them now, but I did them, and I'll do them again tomorrow. You should know how to do an energy diagram for an exothermic reaction. And an exothermic reaction An exothermic reaction is a reaction that gives off heat when you make the products. Now, an endothermic reaction is where you have to add heat. And this is an endothermic reaction because you have to add heat. Heat is on the left side. When it's an exothermic, heat is on the right side. And you should know how to do the energy diagrams. And tomorrow, I'll do that. Next, I talked about chemical equilibrium. And chemical equilibrium, like you see right down here, has a double-headed arrow and you have the reactions going both in the forward direction and the reverse re direction at the same time. And an important thing about an equilibrium reaction or chemical equilibrium, you should know that at equilibrium, the forward and reverse rates of reaction are the same. Again, at equilibrium, for an equilibrium reaction, the forward and reverse rate of reaction are the same. That's the important. All equilibrium have forward reverse rates of reaction the same. Now, the next thing I asked you to learn is the equilibrium constant. And the equilibrium constant KEQ is the sum of the pro or not the sum, the multiplication of the concentration of each product to the power of the coefficient divided by the reactants concentration, the little bracket here means moles per liter to the power of the concentration. Now, important thing, students make a mistake. This is a multiplication. It's wrong. To do a uh, addition. For some reason, instead of this, students do this. And that's wrong. It's a multiplication. I think because they see the plus sign here, they try and put it here. It's not. And you should know how to do the equilibrium of uh, constant and how to generate the equation for it. Now, 
when you can calculate, which I won't ask you ever do, but the amount or magnitude of K equilibrium conveys information how far to completion a reaction has proceeded. In other words, which is more, reactants or products? And when K equilibrium, and I have it here, In a quick uh, uh, summary, you can assume if K equilibrium is much, much greater than one, the concentration of the products is greater than the reactants. If K equilibrium is less than one, then the reactants concentration is greater than the products. So that tells you which you make more of, the reactants or products. When K equilibrium is greater than one, you make more products. When it's less than one, you make more reactants. Now, the next thing I taught you, and it's time for Dr. White's north uh, side of Chicago, French accent with Chatelier's principle. I'll never ask you, what it is, but you should be familiar how to use it. And remember, at an equilibrium, at equilibrium, an equilibrium shifts to the side to reduce the stress put on an equilibrium. How can you put stress on an equilibrium? I went through this yesterday. You also did the lab. And that is, if you change the amount of reactants or products, make them larger or smaller, add or lower, that will affect the equilibrium. Also, temperature effects for an exothermic reaction and an endothermic reaction. Remember, ice bath, removes heat, putting something in hot or boiling water, adds heat. And most of you got this right on the equilibrium lab, which made me happy. Now, let's do something real quick. Or not real quick. If you go to uh, the lecture file of Blackboard, you'll see near the bottom, test number four information. This is stuff I'll give you for test number four. And I'm not giving you a lot on equilibrium. I'm asking you to memorize some stuff. I've kept it way down this semester, but I do give you what the Chandler's principle is. And later on, I'll be talking about, I'll give you what pH is. And also this, my gift to you, if the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus X, you put it in there, then pH is X. I'll also give you this. And we'll talk about this later. I'll give you this. So you should review this, because this is stuff you don't have to memorize. All right, thumbs up, people. You see no? Thank you. All right, let's continue. Let's talk about acids and bases. This is very important. You don't have to know about the Arrhenius theory because nobody uses it anymore. But you do have to know what is a Bronsted-Lowry acid? Or if I just ask, what's an acid? 
An acid is a proton donor. What is a bronsted lorry base or just what's a base? A base is a proton acceptor and you should know this. You should be familiar that these structures or formulas, HCl, H2SO4, HNO3 are acids. You should know NaOH, KOH, ammonia, NH3 are bases. All those are quite strong acids and bases, but I won't talk about strengths on a test or in the final. Now, because water can dissociate, react with itself, I'll never ask you this reaction. There's KW, no, it's not named after me, even though I like to think of it. Those are my initials, but KW is the ionization constant for water. W is for water, K is always in chemistry constant. And I will give you that the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide equals 10, uh, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And this is at room temperature, which is what we mostly live at. And this I'll give you, but it's an important concept to understand, no one to use. Now, when you have a acidic solution, the hydronium ion concentration is greater than hydroxide. When you have a basic solution, the hydroxide ion concentration is higher than that of the hydronium. This is sometimes called alkaline, just like your alkaline batteries. And when you have a neutral solution, the hydroxide ion concentration is equal to the hydronium ion concentration. This is hard to remember. So someone came up with the pH scale and the pH scale is a scale of numbers that specify the hydronium ion concentration. And it's important, this is an aqueous solution. We're done, I'll tell you a true story about pH and Dr. White. And here, pH equals minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration, H3O plus, and therefore, H3O plus equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus X. Then if this is true, you put it in there, pH equals X. That's my gift to you. Now, I will not give this to you, but you should know this. As I say here, this is probably the most important thing I'll teach you all semester one of the important things in all chemistry for your daily life. That's the pH scale. pH scale goes from zero to 14. At seven, pH is neutral. Hydronium ion concentration equals the hydroxide ion concentration. At pH above seven, you have a basic solution. And at pH below seven, you have acidic solution. This I will not give to you. You have to know this. Of all the things I teach you this whole semester, this is probably the most important and useful. Remember, pH goes from zero to 14. The lower the pH, the more acidic it is. The higher the pH, the more basic it is. And it's a logarithmic scale, which I don't have to. Now I rushed through this yesterday, but I'll talk about a little more. A buffer is a solution that resists major changes in pH when small amounts of acid or base are added to it. Again, a buffer is a solution that resists major changes uh, in pH when you add a small amount of acid or base to it. And let's do something 
which I got time so I can do it. Nope, that's not what I want. That's what I want. Everybody see my whiteboard? Clean piece. Thank you. Thumbs up, people. All right. All right, let me read this. What two points each, what happens to the numerical value? And remember, this is what I'm asking, numerical value of the pH of a buffer solution if A, you add a few drops of dilute HCl, HCl hydrochloric acid, also B, what happens to the pH, numerical value of the pH of a buffer solution if you add a few drops of sodium hydroxide, a base. Now, the important thing here is buffer solution. A buffer solution resists a change in pH if you add a small amount of a acid or base. So therefore, the answer for A is, it stays the same or it does not change. What's the answer for B? Same thing. If I can write it. It stays the same. Now, while we're in this area, let's do another one because they're fun and I'm gonna let you have some fun too.
All right, this is for you to try. What happens to the numerical value, and this is important, of the pH if you of a beaker of water at pH 7.0 if you add a few drops of H2SO4 and B, you add a few drops of so NaOH, sodium hydroxide. Why don't you try that out? And if I were in the classroom right now, I'd say, when you're done, look up and smile. Well, I'm not in the classroom. So when you're done, do a thumbs up. For those of you who don't have video, you can do your thumbs up through Zoom. See, just about most of you are done. Give you another 10 seconds. All right, and time's up. Put down your computers. <laughs> but anyways, let me just check with my thumbs up people. You can still see the screen with the problem. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at this. First of all, what you should remember, pH scale. Seven is neutral. Below seven is acidic. Above seven, where it goes up to 14, is basic. Now, I'm not asking you what is the pH, but what happens to the numerical value. H2SO4, acid. When you add acid to water, the pH will become more acidic. Therefore, it gets lower. You could put down gets lower. It drops, or you can put down drops or decreases. Those are all acceptable answers. Now, what is sodium hydroxide? You need to know that is a base. And when you add a base to something, you make it more basic. If you start out at seven or anywhere, it's going to become more basic, which means the pH will increase. So you can put down here increase. You could put an arrow, goes up. You can put in words, goes up. Or gets higher. Those are all, or if you just put higher, I would accept that. And those are all answers. So remember, in a solution of water, when you add acid to it, the pH drops. When you add base, the pH increases. Now, in a buffer solution, the pH, when you add a small amount, Eventually, if you add enough acid or base, it will change. But a buffer, you assume you're only adding a small amount, and that stays the same.
Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about is titrations. And titrations are where you react an acid and a base. Usually a strong base, so the equilibrium goes mainly to the right, and you get a salt. And what happens is you start out with one of these and at neutralization, which for most titrations, we're talking about pH equals 7.0 or 7 neutral. At that point, moles of acid equals moles of base. And for this one, you can ignore the 1000 and you can go from here to here, which means milliliters of acid times mol molarity of acid equals milliliters of base times molarity. You'll be given three of these and you'll be asked to either find Oh, what happened to my red marker? There we go. Either the molarity of the acid or the molarity of the base. Now, tomorrow's lab, instead of having a liquid where you're trying to find molarity, you'll find moles of the acid and convert that into weight, but I'll talk about that tomorrow because we're going to you're going to learn about vitamin C. I guess that's the end. All right, any questions about anything I just reviewed? I'm going to take a tea break. Thank goodness for good tea. All right, let's move on then. Hold on, let me clean up a few things. Hold on. <laughs> I cleaned up too much. Oh, no, I see why I couldn't find it. So one bad thing about All right, everybody see the practice problems? Thank you, thumbs up, people. You should have t-shirts made up. Thumbs up, people, and go like this. Nah, nah. I should have them made up and send them to you. I don't think COD will pay for that. All right, let's go through the acid-based problem set. These are things you should know. First thing, what is an acid? per the bronsted lori theory of acid and base. It's a proton donor. An acid is a proton donor. What is a base? A base is a proton acceptor. Acid gives up its proton, base accepts it. Now, one thing I just realized I didn't talk about in the review, but it will be in the problem set I'll go over is conjugate acids, conjugate bases. All right, you should be able to identify which are the following, acid, base, or salt. Now, for most of the acids for this class, if it begins with an H, hyd oh, excuse me, hydrogen, it's an acid. So A, hydrochloric acid, acid, D, sulfuric acid, acid, and F, 
begins with an H, nitric acid. Now the others, let's look at it. That has an OH, which is called hydroxide, it's going to always be a base. And therefore, sodium hydroxide, or if this were a K, potassium hydroxide, is a base. Now, here's a base, so you just have to learn ammonia is a base. And then I threw in your old favorite, please pass the knackle, sodium chloride. I hope you know is a salt. It's either acid or base. All right, next one, pH. If a solution has, uh, has the hydronium ion concentration equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus three, what is the pH of the solution? And is it basic, acidic, or neutral? Well, we're trying to find the pH. We're given this in important information. You'll know pH equal minus the log of the hydronium ion. If you put that in, what's X? Three, therefore the pH is three. Now what I won't give you and you have to know is the pH scale, zero, seven, 14. Seven in between, halfway between 14 and zero, it's neutral. Below seven, pH is acidic. Above seven, it's basic. Three, I hope you all know is less than seven and therefore it's acidic. And if we do the same for number five, here's the hydronium ion concentration. You're trying to find the pH. Also, is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Here's the pH, here's what we're given. pH equal minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And here it is, remember, when this is 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, the pH is x, which I'll always do on my test or final, and it's seven. Now, is that acidic, basic, or neutral? And you have to remember this chart. Below seven is acidic, above seven is basic, at seven is neutral. So the answer here is neutral. And same thing here, if you do the pH, here's the hydronium, put it in here, pH is 12, it's above seven, so therefore it's basic. Now, let's do a little harder one. If a solution has a hydroxide ion concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus three, what is the pH of the solution and is it acidic, basic, or neutral? So what are we trying to find? pH. What are we given? Hydroxide concentration. Oh no, for pH, you need hydronium. So you have to do two steps. In first step, you'll solve for hydronium. How do you do that? You know KW, yay. No, that's not named after me, but I like to think so, is hydronium times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And that's the dissociation constant for water, KW. Yay, me, not really. And now, if you want to solve for hydronium, you have to get it alone on one side. How do you get it alone on one side when you're multiplying by something else? You divide by that. Anything divided by itself is the number one. But whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. And now I'll rewrite this and say hydronium equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 minus the hydroxide. I'll put that value in, I'll do the math, and it's 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. Now, am I done? No, this is the hydronium ion concentration. I need that to calculate what I'm really being asked to find is pH. And the second step, the number two fell off, solve for pH. pH equals minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And that's minus the log of 
what we just calculated, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11, when this is 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, the pH is x, in this case, x is 11. So the pH is 11. Remember, 7 pH neutral, below 7 acidic pH, above 7 basic. Therefore, oh, I got it right, basic. Oh, let's do another one. These are fun. If the solution has a hydroxide of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7, what is the pH of the solution? Is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Again, two steps. Because you're given pH, you want to get to pH, but you need the hydronium ion concentration, which you're not given. You're given hydroxide. Therefore, the first step you have to determine from this number, this. How do you do this? Hydronium times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. We want to solve for hydroxide, divide this side by it. Whenever you do this side, you have to do that side. We rewrite it. This cancels out. This I've just rewritten. I'll put in a number, calculate it, and this equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. Are we done? No, we're trying to find pH. And therefore, how do we do that? Second step, the two came back. pH equals minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. We put that in. Remember when this is 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, pH is x. In this case, x is 7. pH is 7. When pH is 7, it's neutral. All right, well, we did something like this earlier. Well, let's do it again. What happens, notice I'm not talking about does it become acidic, basic, or neutral. I'm asking what happens to the numerical value of the pH of a beaker of water if you add a few drops of concentrated NaOH. Well, first of all, you have to know that is a base. And by adding a base, remember above seven is basic, you add a base, it becomes more basic. Below seven is acidic. When you add a base acid, it becomes more acidic, a lower pH. So in this case, if you add a base, it becomes more basic, therefore the pH increases. You could also put down the arrow up or it gets bigger. All those would work. Now in B, you add a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid. That's probably the most widely used and strongest acid in all of chemistry. And when you add an acid, you make it acidic, but the actual numeric value gets lower. So you can put down decreases or lower or an arrow down. Wow, doesn't this seem like deja vu all over again? Now, what happens to the numerical value of the pH of a beaker of a buffer solution if you add a few drops of dilute acid solution? Well, by definition, buffer. pH doesn't change when you add a small amount of acid or base. And here, small amount of acid stays the same. When you add a small amount of base, it stays the same. Tea break. Oh, the bad thing about teaching at COD, I don't bring tea to the class. I just bring my water bottle. So now that I'm teaching out of COD North, otherwise known as my office in my home, I can have tea. Yay. All right. Number 12, 10 points. If you have to add a 1.35 times 10 to the third milliliters of a 1.53 capital M NaOH solution to neutralize 1.87 times 10 squared milliliters of an aqueous HCL solution, HCL solution, what is the molarity of the HCL solution? This is a titration. 
you're adding an acid to a base or base to an acid. And one of those two, acid or base, you're trying to find a molarity. At neutralization, which is what you've done here, moles of acid equal moles of base. And you have, this really means milliliters of acids times the molarity of the acid equals the milliliters of the base times molarity. Now here I made a mistake. This line should be on this side, not that one. We want to solve for molarity of acid. We have to get rid of milliliters of acid. So we just divide this side by milliliters and you have to do it this side. And therefore we put in, this cancels out. Again, the line was on the wrong side. Dr. White made a mistake. Shh, don't tell anybody. But molarity of the acid, in this case, HCl equals milliliters of base times molarity of base divided by milliliters of acid. If we look up here, what's the milliliters of the base? This, because NaOH is your base. What's the molarity of the base? This. And therefore, final thing to put in, what's the milliliters of acid? Remember, HCl is an acid, is this. Milliliters cancel out, we're left with molarity, which is the unit we want, but it'll be actually molarity of acid. Remember, on test four, like my test two and one, two, and three, and it'll be the same on the final, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. Some of you, I lost points that you didn't have to on test three, because you didn't follow this. Now, for a multiplication division, you get the same number of significant figures in the number in your answer as the number you're multiplying or dividing as the fewest. And Dr. White's in his rut again, three, 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 three significant figures. So the molarity of this acid is 11.0 moles. If I look at the clock, it's almost 5, uh, 10, 9.50. Time for a break. And why don't you come back at 9.55. I'll give you an extra 20 second break. It's time for Dr. White to do his stretching exercises. When you get older, you'll do those too. And you should do them when you're younger. See you in five.
All right, ring, ring. Calling you all back to school like the old school marms did in the cartoons and everything and movies with their bell. Like in Little House on the Prairie, which you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, I just pulled the generation gap on you. But anyways, that was a famous TV program long ago. All right, let's go back to the pH problem set. Once again, I'll ask for my thumbs up, people. Do you see the pH problem? Thank you. All right, let's do one more of these. Oh, let's do number 14, because it looks interesting. They all do. If you have to add 358 milliliters of a 5.67 molar HNO3 nitric acid solution to neutralize 358 milliliters of an aqueous KOH solution, KOH potassium hydroxide, a base, what's the molarity of the KOH solution? So what are we being asked to find? Molarity of the KOH solution. Oh, look, someone was nice enough to write, it's a base. You're given how many milliliters of that base. You're given HNO3 nitric acid and acid, how many milliliters at what molarity to neutralize it? At neutralization, this is a titration. You have milliliters of base times molarity of base equals milliliters of acid times molarity of acid. We're trying to find the molarity of the base. So I divide, I want to get rid of the milliliters of base. I'll divide this by milliliters of base. Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. And therefore, this cancels out. I'm left with molarity of base equal milliliters of acid times molarity of acid divided by milliliters of base over here. What's the milliliters of acid? 358 milliliters. What's the molarity? 5.67. What's the volume or molliters of base needed or you use? 358. Milliliters cancels out. I'm left with molarity. Do the math. Three, 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 three significant figures. By the way, when you add the same amount of an acid or base to the same amount of a base or acid, both have the same molarity, which is what we just proved here. All right. Now, To make up for the deficiency, in other words, I forgot to put it in the problem set, let's do the following. First of all, thumbs up people, you see a blank page? Thank you.
hang in there. If you were in a classroom, you'd be watching me write this on the board. All right, I'll do this one, then I'll let you try one. For the following reaction, label each either acid base, conjugate acid, conjugate base. What's a conjugate? Something that differs by just one proton. A hydrogen, that's the easy way for you to remember. If you notice, you have a nitrogen here, nitrogen here, and three oxygens. And these are conjugates. I'm going to go technicolor on you. Here you have oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. So these would be conjugates. Now, on this side, by definition, on the right side, these are always the conjugates. Whoa. So I put there. Now, let's look at W, nitric. I won't give the rest of the name yet. And it goes from here to here. Has it lost the hydrogen, H plus really, or gained it? One, none. It's lost it. It's given it away. It's donated it. What's something that donates a proton? It's an acid, nitric acid. Now, Let's look at this, X. It goes from here, one hydrogen, here, two, plus the plus side, because this is OH minus. This is gain a proton. What is something that gains or accepts a hydrogen, which is easier for you to remember that way, or a proton, and that's a base. And sodium hydroxide is a base. Well, two more to go. If we're going from here, to here, it's conjugate, and that's why you take the time to figure out the conjugates. Has going from Y to W, is that gaining a hydrogen, really proton, or losing it? It's gaining. What is something that gains or accepts a proton? A base. So therefore, Y, because it's on this side, is conjugate, and it's really the conjugate base. Since I have a conjugate acid, this should be acid. Let's find out. We go from Z to X. Have we lost the hydrogen, really a proton, or gained it? Two, one. We've lost it. What's something that loses or donates or gives up a proton? It's an acid. And because it's on the right side, it's the conjugate acid. Again, let's go through this, but first, important tea break, because this is thirsty work. When you see a problem like this, where you're asked to identify in a reaction, acid base, conjugate acid, conjugate base, remember that on this side, the right side of the reaction, in this case, Y and Z are always conjugates. Now, you identify the conjugates by what's different by a proton. So we have this one, W and Y. We look at the next one. Here we have sodium hydroxide, X, and Z is its conjugate because it differs by only one proton Forget about the cation if there is one. Same thing here to sodium. And now on this side, going from W to Y, you've lost or donated a proton, which is what an acid is. Going from X to Z, you've gained a proton or hydrogen, and you've accepted it. Base, proton acceptor. Now to go to the conjugates, you look at the reverse reaction. Going from Y to its conjugate W, what happens? No hydrogen, one hydrogen, actually H plus. And what's something that accepts a proton? It's a base and it's on this side and that makes it the conjugate base. 
finally z to x, what do we have here? We have two hydrogens, it goes to one, and what is something that gives up a proton? It's really a proton. It's an acid, but since it's on this side, it's a conjugate acid. And since Dr. White loves to share, I'm gonna have you try one on your own. And why don't you try label B, C, D, and E, acid base, conjugate acid, conjugate base. And I'll let you have some fun. Am I a nice guy or what? Oh, I see everybody thinking and the smoke is coming out of their ears. That's an old cartoon thing from when I was a kid. I have a quick question. I do quick questions, even slow ones. Will you be doing these type of questions tomorrow um, after you talk about the lab too? If you want me to, ask and I will. Okay, thanks. Remember, there's no such thing as a dumb question in my class and a question that's always valid is, could you do one of these type of problems? And my answer will always be if I have time, yes. and. We do have time because I sped up a little to finish up before Thursday. But since you don't have to take the test in class or actually in Zoom, one thing, make sure you remind me to do it because I might forget. This one's a little challenging, so I'll give you a little extra time. While you're doing that, I go to sleep for a while. No, I'm not. When you're done, if I were in class, I say, look up and smile. If not, give me a thumbs up. I see all of you are drinking, or a couple of you. I can look out and see through my screen and see you. I see you. Now Dr. White's getting silly, but it's fun. Don't ever grow up. Always let the little kid inside of you be there. Makes life more enjoyable. All right, let's get this, let's get going. Question is, for this reaction, Label B, C, D, and E, acid, base, conjugate acid, conjugate base. First thing, look for the conjugates, sulfur, sulfur. These two differ by H plus or just a hydrogen. I have two here. I just have one here. Next, ooh, nitrogen, nitrogen. This differs by one proton or just count the hydrogens. And these are conjugates. Now, let's look at H2SO4. Oh, before we do that, I'm gonna be smart and everything on the right is always labeled conjugate. Now, going from B to D, did we gain or lose a hydrogen? Really a proton, but hydrogen two to one, we've lost it. 
what's something that donates a proton? A proton donor is an acid. What's something that's a, let's look at C. C goes from C to E. Has it gained or lost a proton? Really hydrogen, three to four. It's gained a proton. What's something that accepts a proton? A proton acceptor is a base. And sure enough, ammonia is an at base. Sulfuric acid is an acid. Ooh, Dr. White's on the right track. Now we have to do the conjugates. We look at D going to B, and we're going this direction goes from one hydrogen to two. Actually a proton accepts, but think of the hydrogens. What's something that accepts a hydrogen or proton? Proton acceptor is a base. So D is the conjugate base. Next, if we look at E, the final one, it goes from E to C. And going this way, does it gain or lose a proton? Really discount the hydrogens. Here it's four, here it's three. Oops, there's one less. What's something that gives up or donates a proton? Acid. And it's on this side, so it's the conjugate acid. And that's how we do that. Any questions on that? Going once, twice. By the way, if you want instant replay later today, like I've been really good this whole semester, thank you, Dr. White. You're welcome. It's, it's really hard to make sure I keep up and I make sure, so I don't wanna, I'll post this video and you can go back and look at it again in case you're having problems with that. All right. Let me move on into chapter 17. I'm going to skip chapter 16 on oxidation and redox. Yeah, that just deals with batteries. I'll just skip it. But I do want to talk about chapter 17. Now, listen carefully. Chapter 17 will not be on test number four, but it will be on the final a few points. So it's something you should learn, and it's also for your everyday life. And I'll go through it. And there's no problem set, but tomorrow or next week, I'll do problems over the weekend. Just so you know, a week from tomorrow, first of all, is the final. And the final exam, I'll give information about most students when they take it, usually it takes about an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes to take it. Even though if we were in class, I'd give you two full hours. But most of my students finish early over the years. I've written the final enough time. I do a new one every semester, but I've done enough time. Hold on. I ran out of tea. But I'll post that by Monday, if not sooner. But let's go to the new chapter. There's some important things I like to talk about. And once again, thumbs up, people. Can you see chapter seven? Thank you. All right, let's talk about nuclear radiation. Now, these slides, uh, the switch is off. Will this be on the final? I'll tell you when it will be on. When we talk about radio elements, those are unstable elements, isotopes of an element that will emit energy spontaneously to form a stable isotope. In other words, an element loses something to form a more stable element or isotope. And the energy that emits from those isotopes is called radio radiation. Now, switches off. There are different types of radiation. One is an alpha particle, which contains two protons and two neutrons. I should warn you, Dr. White has never worked in nuclear chemistry. Uh, and I'll tell you a sad story if I have time later on. But anyways, 
and it's emitted from the radioactive nuclei. So you actually lose to get a different molecule element, two protons and two neutrons. And the alpha particle has a positive charge. A beta particle is uh, something that has the exact charge and mass of electron. Why nuclear chemists didn't call it electron, I don't know. But it has a negative charge. A positron is a particle produced with a positive charge. There they were, why didn't just call it a proton? Don't know. And finally, there's a form of very high radiation that doesn't have mass or charge and is emitted by a radioactive nuclei, which is quite damaging. It's called the gamma rays. Now, in our universe, gamma rays will not turn you into the Hulk. For those of you who know the story of the Hulk. Now, radioactive particles can decay. They form where it's called a nucleotide, nuclide, I'm pronouncing it wrong, is transformed to another nucleide of an element by giving up some sort of energy or radiation. That can be alpha, beta, or gamma rays. Switch is still off on. Will this be on a test or a final? Won't be on a test. Switches on, full blast. Now there's something called the half-life of a radioisotope. And this is very important for you to understand things about nuclear energy, for example. And the rate of radioactive decay is the half-life, the half-life also abbreviated T1 half is the amount of time required for one half of a given quantity of a radioactive substance to undergo decay. And that means it's transformed into something else. So you should know this. Let's go to our whiteboard. This is stuff that switches on. Sorry about that. Once in a while, my fingers hit the buttons on my pen and does a strange thing. All right, let's take a look at this. Depending on my mood, three to five points. If you have 800 grams of a radioactive element Z with a half-life, that's what T1 half means of two years, then how much Z? Can you see it? Hold on, let me check. Thumbs up, people. Can you see that? All right, somebody should have told me. I got it. Now can you see it? All right, thanks. Zoom has a bad feature when you switch. You don't really know it's successfully switched unless you open up another interface and then you even still don't know. That's why I have my thumbs up, people. All right, let's start again. If you have 800 grams of a radioactive element, Z, 
with a half-life, that's what T1 half means, of two years, how much Z will you have after four years? So let's take a look at how do you do this? Now there's a fancy formula, but for the way I do it, you don't need it. What are we trying to find? Grams of C, what are we given? Half-life is two years and the time we're trying to measure after four years. Now you can use a fancy formula, but a better way is you start out with 800 grams. And the half-life is two years. And after two years, you'll have half of this, which is 400 grams. Now, if we have four years, we got to do another two years. And the half-life is half, two years. So after two years, you'll have two of that. And you'll end up with 200 grams. And that's your answer. And that's how you do these problems. Now, one of the reasons this is very important, let's see if I can find it real quick. I'm going to rely. Did everybody see the 4.5 billion years? I'm just, thank you. Now, uranium 238 and 235 are, I think, and I might be wrong, but it's about right. That's the half life of radioactive waste from nuclear reactors. What's the half life? Yep, that's right. Four and a half billion years. So if you have a thousand pounds of uranium waste after four and a half billion years, you only have half of that. You'll still have billions of pounds of waste. And that's the fallacy of nuclear energy where they say it's clean. Yeah, it's clean because it doesn't immediately uh, emit things to the atmosphere, but you're left with a waste that's hazardous that's just going to be around for billions of years. And that's why it's important to understand half-life, especially when you're talking about how clean nuclear energy is. Right now by Northwestern, by Lake Michigan, I don't know if it's still there, there used to be a, within a mile or less of Lake Michigan, a huge nuclear reactor for Commonwealth Edison, our electrical power company, and they closed it down and they still have thousands of pounds of uranium waste there that what do you do with it? And government a number of years ago had an idea outside of um, Las Vegas, Nevada in the desert. Let's dig into the rock and make this big repository and store all our nuclear waste problem there. You got to store that for billions of years. How do you store it safely? Well, they did some tests. They came up with these containers. Oh, they'll work. And guess what? After about two or three years, they started leaking. Now it ain't going to last a billion years or more. And also the people who lived there and their representatives said, you don't want this in our backyard, all this hazardous stuff. So it's still a problem. And that's an important thing. All right, let's get back to a couple more important things. I rely on my thumbs up people. Can you see? No, thank you. All right, let's move on. Because now when it comes to nuclear energy, the next two slides, you should know. Switch is on. This will be not on test four but the final. And the first one is nuclear fission. 
And nuclear fission is a process in which a large nuclei splits into two medium-sized nuclei and gives off a lot of energy and free neutrons and a lot of energy. And this is the first type. It's used in nuclear reactors. If I ask you, what's an example of nuclear fission, you should know nuclear reactors. Also, this was the, I think the first atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was a nuclear fission bomb. Was it used uranium? Now, a uranium radioactive isotope of uranium. So nuclear fission is what happens when you have a large nuclei and splits into smaller ones and gives off a lot of energy. And that's really what happens in a nuclear reactor for our electricity. Now, the other one you should know is nuclear fusion. Remember the U, and I'll explain why. And this is a process which a small nuclei are put together to make larger ones. And where does this happen? On our sun. The next time you happen to feel the sunlight on your body, or don't look up directly at the sun, but if you did, you'd see all that energy coming out, and I think you can find it on YouTube. And what is that happening? There you have two hydrogen atoms slamming together to form a helium atom, and when that happens, it gives off a tremendous amount of heat, which is our sun. Unfortunately, the second bomb, the hydrogen bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, was a fu nuclear fusion bomb. Now, if I ask you on a test, give an example of a nuclear fusion reaction or an example of nuclear fusion in our daily life, I like to remember fusion, you, the sun. You, you, fusion, the sun. And then fission is a nuclear reactor. No, you, this deny. And that's what you should know. If you think about it, look up at the sun, and that's chemistry going on, which is always why Dr. White has a smile when someone says, I hate chemistry. What they really mean to say is, I hate whoever taught me chemistry because it wasn't fun. Hopefully in my class it is, and you'll enjoy it. You've enjoyed it. Uh, as I look at the clock, our time is almost up. Let's do a few commercials from Dr. White. Don't forget, tonight, office hours at, on Zoom from 6 to 7. If you need me to stay late, I will. Don't tell anybody I'm being nice. Actually, I think somebody did because I've got three people waiting in the wait list for my fall semester 1211. You're lucky you got in. And also, don't forget, tomorrow after class or before, I'll be sending out the um, password for test four, which you'll have till Friday morning to get to me. I'll check my email if you ever have any questions during the test because there's no such thing as a dumb question in my class. Uh, next, today, later today, I'll be uploading to the assignment area, the last lab, I wrote a good one, titration. You can look, you can look at the Zoom or you don't have to. Just do my lab. Also, important thing, labs. Check all the lab scores. If you're missing something, let me know and I'll look and see if I missed it. But let me know because I'm all caught up as of last night to all the labs that were due through today. If you haven't had it in today's lab, don't worry, I'll still grade it. But through 10, I'm caught up. And you, if you're missing something, let me know. And with that, I'm gonna let you out a whole 15 seconds early. And I get to say, I haven't used it all day. <laughs> Goodbye. Gain gazoon, be healthy. Don't forget to study due to practice problems. Tomorrow, I'll do more acid bases and also equilibrium to help you for test four because I rushed through some stuff. And with that, 
expire, 